Did you know that selling just 1% of a project's tokens can move the price upwards of 20 to 30%? It sounds crazy, I know, but it is in fact true. In today's video, we're going to be explaining that and so much more. Hi, I'm Tom from Crypto Gurus, and if you want to learn more, keep watching. First up, the disclaimer. Nothing in this video is financial advice. Please pause the video now and read the disclaimer in full. In this video, I'm going to be discussing liquidity, trading volume, and many other topics with Lewis Barber, the CEO of Helios, which is a market-making service provider. We're not gonna be talking about Helios at any point during this interview. He was generous enough to give up his time, come on the channel and basically explain all of these relatively complex but very, very important to understand topics. For example, you might be used to logging onto CoinMarketCap and looking at trading volume. However, that's very different to trading liquidity. Trading volume is often very fake numbers, whereas trading liquidity is what really matters. If any of that has confused you, this is obviously the perfect video for you, as we'll be explaining that throughout. If you open up the description now, you're gonna see time codes in there next to each of the questions that I ask during this interview. So if you'd like to skip ahead at any point or simply open up the description now and see what kind of questions we'll be covering, please feel free to do so. Without any further ado, let's begin with the interview. I'm here today with Lewis from Helios, which is a market making service provider. We're going to be chatting about liquidity, volume, and many other factors affecting exchanges. Thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having us. You're welcome. Uh, the first thing I want to point out is this is not a sponsored review. No money has been paid whatsoever. So if you'd just like to introduce yourself to the audience, explain a bit about your background. Yeah, so I, uh, yeah, I work for a number of years in financial services, mm -hmm. um, doing software development technology consultancy um, for various uh, banking project oh. and last year I left to start my own business which uh, is a kind of, which we funded for an ICO so um, that's a kind of data analytics and investment company where we build uh, various different trading algorithms mostly in crypto um, <coughs> invest in ICO projects um, so we have quite a lot of exposure to kind of tokens and, mm -hmm. and the crypto environment um, yeah uh, and then we kind of, through that process, built some trading algorithms for our token, um, and we, we've recently spun that off into a separate company with, with in a joint venture with some partners of ours um, to offer that technology as a service to other ICOs. So we're just trying to take a slightly different spin on market making from what you kind of typically see in crypto, which mm -hmm. I think we'll talk a bit more about in a minute. Yeah. So you kind of, you launched uh, the Sharp platform and you said you approached exchanges and the market making was absolutely terrible. So you guys decided to put together Helios because you wanted to provide your own solution that you yeah. could use on your own token that yeah. other people could use as well. Yeah, so obviously through like, founding a business with an ICO, you have the challenge of how, you know, then people will expect, and rightly so, like we have this token and they want liquidity yes. for that token. So they, immediately afterwards it's like okay, so what exchange is this going to be on when's it going to be on the exchange the exchange exchange and um, and yeah I mean, you know so that's something that you have to then deal with as a founder i guess and like navigate that space um so yeah we spoke to a number of exchanges for listing our own token this was like early 2018 um way before the whole helios, helios stuff started um and the message we got from many of them was like, okay, we'll list you, but you need to have um, you need to have a market maker. Mm -hmm. So we're like, okay, I mean, they charge listing fees. I kind of thought some of the value of that would be mm -hmm. you get listed, stop, yeah. and then they charge you all of that because there's some value to being listed through maybe them having their own market making, but whatever. So we so we spoke to some market makers and. Um, you know, try, just trying to suss out what, what they do, what they charge. Like, I'm paying a listing fee, um, and now I have to pay a market maker as well. Um, given the nature of our business at Sharp, it just didn't make sense. Yeah. So, yeah, so we developed some of our own in house technology specifically for tokens. Um, yeah, that was at the beginning, and then, and then we were kind of running that, um, and it's kind of fundamentally different to what a lot of these 
companies who call themselves market makers are doing. Um, so yeah, building on that, I think the biggest problem you were alluding to earlier yeah. was the difference between liquidity and volume. Other market makers provide volume, which is listed on things like coin market. Yeah. Yeah. But they don't have real depth in the market through liquidity. Do you want to just explain the difference? Yeah. What's liquidity, like what's volume, and why? Yeah, and I guess different? what the definition of a market maker is, right? Mm-hmm. So um, we recently wrote a blog post, like James um, pu- published, my, uh, my co founder James published mm-hmm. it, saying, um, you know, referring to like, when the first market makers came about, like the 1600s, to create liquidity for some like mm-hmm. East India shipping or whatever. But it's like that's where it originated from. Mm-hmm. And, the purpose of a market maker is to make prices, right? Quote prices on an order book, that's it. Mm-hmm. You, don't, you don't do any trading until someone trades against you because you're a market maker. Yeah, so you have, you have buy and you have sell. Yeah, that's okay. yeah okay. exactly, that's it in the raw sense. Okay, yeah, there's some sophistication in how you actually run one profitably. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's the whole industry itself. But in crypto, then, you know, it's, it's gone in a completely different direction where really what all these people who call themselves the market makers are doing is inflating volumes on exchanges. So a lot of people know about fake volume, but I think when they hear the term and they think fake volume means an, an exchange is reporting some volume that doesn't exist, mm-hmm. which is not the case. The exchange is reporting volume that exists. It's just that volume is being created by someone who's calling themselves a market maker, mm-hmm. acting on behalf of an ICO project, trading orders back and forth that are not really, they're not real, they're creating a false perception of demand. So obviously we didn't want that for our token because it doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, what does that achieve right, in the long run? People can't, can't actually trade those markets because mm-hmm. there's no orders on the book. Um, so yes, yeah, so we took a very different approach to obviously designing the technology because we we're doing it for ourselves, for our token, and um, took, I guess, more of a traditional approach. Um, to that, yeah. Um, so I guess yeah, so that completes the loop on that question. So they're basically they're carrying out a lot of trades to create volume, but the problem is they're not actually they're not actually trading with anyone else. They're effectively just trading with themselves. Yeah. So when you see that volume, it's fake numbers because you can't actually go into the market and make any trades yourself. Yeah, I mean, Whereas you might be able liquidity, to make... that's <laughs> that's the difference in the sense that you have the depth of the order book, so if yeah. there's like an order, you can actually go and make a trade. Yeah, there's someone else on the other side of that trade right, saying, hey, you want to sell, you want to buy this price, I'm happy to sell at this price. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the moment, like, and I mean, the crypto ecosystem has evolved in this way because if you go on any coin aggregator site, what you see is you know, volume up mm-hmm. there and people come to you and say, you know, this only has this only has twenty dollars of volume today. There's, I, there's, there's no liquidity. They interchange the terms, mm-hmm. um, but actually, there's no visibility of what liquidity there is in the market on these sites at the moment. So, you know, it, it's a, it, it's really something that's come about by just naturally. I don't think it was like intentionally done in a deceptive way. Yeah. But it had, it is actually quite deceptive. And then obviously greed takes over. Exchanges want fed volume because that gives them fees. Mm-hmm. And then market makers want to play that game because they can basically be a middleman between the ICOs and the exchange. Um, and in a way, it's kind of a negative cycle because if, if a market maker creates fake volume, that can actually help the price of the project. Uh, which yeah, in the short sh- term, for in sure, the short yeah. term, yeah. Which so many people in cryptos have such a short term mentality yeah, yeah. that creating volume, like it gets listed on Coin Market Cap, and someone sees, wow, that token has one yeah. million dollar volume. Loads of people want to be buying it, right? People FOMO into <laughs> it. It's a, yeah, it's obvious, like just like a negative yeah. cycle, which thankfully we've seen less of now. Yeah. I assume because I think because it's now that we're out, right? out of the bull market, the ridiculous hype. I think also it's stopped working. Yes. You, you can only trick people for so long, mm-hmm. right? Like, if we were chatting earlier, we said like seven, I think it's like 75% of tokens have lost over 90% of their value since the all time high. It could, the number could be, I don't even know what it is now, but like mm-hmm. last time I looked. Um, and the re- a lot of the reason for that is because of some of these, you know, tactics and, and things that go on. So people understand a, a bit more now about, you know, about that because they've yeah. had to look at their crypto and go, oh, I'm going to sell them now. And then, some people have seen if they have a larger holding that that might be quite hard. Yeah, um, that's, that's an interesting point. You were talking about that earlier. You said that 
a lot of these cryptos have gone down 90% because you can shift the price by 20 odd percent by just selling less than one percentage of the supply yeah. as the liquidity is actually yeah. so low. So even yeah. though there's high volume, yeah. you can move the price because liquidity is really the key factor, not the volume. Yeah, and th there's also like this concept um, in like academic literature around market making called hidden liquidity. Mm -hmm. um, and it's this idea that you look at an order book and it has some orders on it um, and you trade against those orders and when they go, some new ones pop up, mm -hmm. more or less in the same place, right? Maybe not exactly the same place, because buying and selling should move the price. But, you know, you don't take a load of orders from the order book, and then nothing else comes back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so if you're not done, like, selling your position or buying your position, mm -hmm. now you have to sell at, like, a really unfavorable price, or yeah. you have to wait a few days. And, you know, in crypto where things move fast, who knows, who knows, you know, how yeah, that's going to be. The liquidity premium. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, so it's sort of something that we saw um, through some of the tokens that we had that were listed on, you know, just uh, slightly less, you know, I don't know, uh, <laughs> what's the word? Slightly less, um, like, or morally questionable exchanges, <laughs> yeah. and and so yeah, yeah, nice way to put it yeah. and and you like you know it became very apparent because the holding wasn't necessarily you know like your typical have a crypto investor would have in a token like a slightly larger amount you know by comparison. So that also really highlighted how bad the problem was for me, and is how we kind of ended up going from having our own technology for our token to saying maybe there's kind of a gap for a service um, where people kind of like, like doing this interview very audaciously say, this is how it's working, this is the problem, this is why we want to change it. Um, yeah, and where that, was, where that was sort of came from. Yeah, well, the first example is of course your own token. As you said, you built this because you needed a market maker for your token. Yeah. So talking of the Sharp platform token, you guys have a trading volume, it's just forty-five dollars I believe in the last twenty-four hours. Why yeah. I understand that's the, op that's the opposite of wash trading where you're creating fake high numbers. Well why yeah. is why is the number so low then? Yeah, it's like when you say when you call me out on that, I'm like, oh god, I know, like everybody's gonna go, oh, forty-five dollars, <laughs> that's horrible. No, I'm never gonna buy and own that thing. And like, yeah. That that's because that's because it's all organic. Um, and I joked about this with someone I spoke to the other day who, as I said, like everybody expects in crypto, like they know what a chart, a volume, a stock chart, like in the stock market looks like, with volume, and they look at it and they're like, yeah, that, that's what like, a, you know, a candlestick chart with volume should look like. Mm -hmm. But when they're looking at the stock market, they're looking at assets that have, you know, that are, I mean, incredibly liquid, I mean, a, high volume. Yeah, one of, one of those stocks could be, the same, if not a higher market cap than the bit, or than the whole market. Yeah, I mean, Apple was a triple, like, about four times. Yeah, recently yeah. became a trillion dollar, first trillion dollar stock. So, you know, like, you need to get that perspective. You're not looking at um, some, you know, small cap stock that's listed on an alternative stock exchange. If you went and looked at that, you'd see a very different volume pattern where some days there's nothing, some days there's 100,000. Because they're not trading as frequently. It's, yeah. it's all genuine. <laughs> um, so that's what our volume looks like. And yeah, people look up, depending on the day, they can either be totally aghast, like, oh my god, I don't like that. Or other days they might go, oh, someone traded 60k today. <laughs> <laughs> so the key difference being that there is liquidity. So even though there's yeah. $45 of volume, I could go into the market right now and actually buy or sell tokens. Yeah. Because then, you guys provided that service. Yeah, so we provide that as a service to kind of our token holders, that's where it started. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and, and the kind of the way we do it is basically making sure that, well, the technology ensures that you can always buy and sell at a certain price. So, mm -hmm. uh, like at every price, sorry. So there's always an amount quoted at every price. So if you would go and look at the order book for Bitcoin um, or Ethereum or you know, Coinbase Pro or uh, you know, Bitfinex or something like that, you would, you would see an order book that looks very much like our order book. Um, you know, well, speaking of those then, do you believe that 
this is really just a problem for smaller tokens? Or do you believe it's a problem across the entire market? The reason I ask is because I did a video recently and I, I based some of the research on an article I found where someone basically showed the $23 million worth of bullish trades moved the price of Bitcoin by 1 billion, or moved the market cap, sorry, which was a leverage of about 44 times, which seems absolutely crazy. So well, in that, sorry, sorry, what were the numbers again? Uh, they had a $23 billion, sorry, $23 million worth of bullish trades, which increased the market cap. 23 with, million. Which increased the market cap by 1 billion. So that was yeah, 44 yeah, times, was. times the size. Do you think that's a problem for Bitcoin, Ethereum and all, all projects based well, on the exchanges or is it just certain tokens? I, I don't know because of, I don't have, haven't got a specific article, but from what you said, I expect it's, that's going to be related to basically stops being squeezed on, on, a, on probably BitMEX, mm -hmm. um, which is the largest futures market. So yeah, people trading with high leverage using stop losses and then those stop losses cascading into market orders. So if somebody trades, um, what did you say, 20, 20 million? 23 million. So a 23 million market order on BitMEX would probably, oh, I've got it, no, no, I don't right. think it was actually on BitMEX. I don't think it was futures. I think it was just the open market. Oh, you wouldn't know, right, because it would arbitrage. Okay. So you don't, it's just a market order that moves the market. Okay. And then people arbitrage, obviously, across to the futures market because it's a lower price. Mm -hmm. And then they run stops on the futures market. So. And then that cascades, and, <laughs> mm -hmm. and then suddenly the price just runs up. So, yeah, there's liquidity issues in a way mm -hmm. on these highly leveraged markets, but they have their own mechanisms. Like BitMEX has a huge insurance fund, which they use to basically bail out the whole market on their exchange if there's not enough liquidity on the order book. So, in my experience, you know, these markets are highly liquid. Um, so it's more of a problem just with the, the smaller tokens rather than the bigger coins? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now, I, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask you. <laughs> okay. uh, what's your opinion on Bitfinex, who are consistently accused <laughs> of wash trading? Yeah, I, I mean... That's an easy question. No, it's, it's, inter <laughs> it's interesting because Bitfinex, you know, um, just looking at the numbers, were way up there with like a very liquid... BTC market fairly recent, you know, recently like less than um, less than six months ago, um, and their their significance as a player in the market for BTC has declined quite a bit recently. To I think they're doing like sixty million a day last time I looked in, in BTC volumes. And they used to be doing over two hundred. Um, so yeah, I mean I, I don't know why people are not using it. Could be really as much as they were. It could be related to tether. Um, but I, I don't think, as an exchange, they would. It would make a huge amount of sense for them to be, you know, carrying out these, you know, deceptive strategies like wash trading and fake creating fake volume because it did appear from their order books that they, they have quite a lot of, you know, wash trading. You no, know, yeah. well, no, quite a lot of liquidity on their books. Okay. But I think if you know these a, these big exchanges, they all have APIs, and I don't personally think the problem. Um, of wash trading a lot of the time originates with the exchange is more this chain of exchanges want to earn fees they list ICO projects who they then say you need a market maker and then that market maker is kind of like an unknown you know mm -hmm. mysterious middleman who is creating fake volume on the exchange which is paid for by the ICO team and then that money ultimately pays fees to the exchange. Mm -hmm. so, so they're quite happy. Yeah, they're getting their fees. They're, yeah, they're possibly happy for it to be happening. I'm not saying Bitfinex, of course, is happy for it to happen or that it's happening there, but you know, I think that's more what goes on. So if people have pointed the finger at other exchanges, Bitfinex and, and others, um, you know, it, you know it, the problem could be lying like, outside of you know, really that the person who the finger's being pointed at. Okay. When you what think if I ask you about tethers? Would you say the same thing? Because sometimes I've seen their volume is higher than their total market cap. Yeah, which, which is, is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, but we actually did some analysis of um, of the order books, and um, we tried to come up with a metric that you can use to compare liquidity across assets mm -hmm. um, that actually factors in volume, order books, market cap, because 
sometimes people say, well, if I sell 50k of this token, I'm going to wipe, you know, whatever off the price. Mm -hmm. You say, yeah, but the market cap of that token is like two million, so that's quite a, yeah. quite a big, you know, it's yeah. actually quite a large order. It's like a billion dollar Bitcoin. Yeah, it's all a ratio. <laughs> yeah. They're not quite a billion, is it? Yeah, but it's a very large Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. Hundreds of millions. Of yeah, it's sort of just a ratio of percentage. Of yeah, people. so we wanted to analyze that, and what we found was Tether is actually incredibly liquid, which I was quite surprised by. Um, so Tether, I think, was the most liquid asset that we analyzed. Really? Fo yeah, followed by Bitcoin, um, and then some things like Ether and Ripple were just surprisingly liquid. Uh, of course, we didn't look at all of the exchanges, but we were very surprised to see that Tether is liquid. Yeah. Um, I mean, that kind of makes sense in a way. It just the numbers don't indicate illiquid, yeah. just indicate it's fake, weird, yeah. just pure fake, yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's just... It be a higher than the market cap in a 24-hour volume. I think it's highly traded because it's on so many exchanges. Mm -hmm. um, it was obviously a big... you know, Because from a regulatory point of view, a lot of crypto exchanges can't handle fiat mm -hmm. currency. So, um, but they want to give their, their customers that kind of stability to be able to trade. Mm -hmm. um, in and out of something that's stable. So what they used was historically was tether. Yeah. So I, I don't know, to an extent, I think it's just highly so circulated. I mean I have my own personal doubts about tether yes, as a group. Yeah. Them. But from a liquidity point of view I can't actually can't come I'm great can't take of what I see. Okay. Which I can't believe really what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> we'll cut that out of the video. Yeah. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, now I'm gonna ask a few questions from the community. Okay. Shut down a few uh, that they all wanted to see. Uh, let me just find a quick bit. Okay, the first one. Why do exchanges have higher maker fees than taker fees? Did you explain to them that we were doing this interview? Yes, I okay. did. I, did. Cool, I was just surprised why you had a question. Yeah, yeah, I figured, you know, the yeah, yeah. community yeah. to see what they want us to ask. Um, so, yeah, so why do they have higher maker fees than taker fees? I haven't seen that. Okay. So I've never seen that. I mean, take a fees are usually always higher than make fees. Oh, okay. Um, and in fact, on certain exchanges, maybe, maybe that's meant to be the question. Yeah, possibly. Or they have higher take. So fees take a fees are higher than make fees because you want to incentivize liquidity, which yeah. you need. You want people to make liquidity. You want people to make, make, make it exactly. Um, and the re and in actual in normal markets like um, in regulated markets. Pretty much everywhere, you don't have um, you don't have any fees for makers. Mm -hmm. You get a, what's called a rebate, which is a portion of the taker fee goes to the maker, mm -hmm. and then the rest goes to the exchange, um, and that creates very liquid markets, which is what they have on uh, Bitmex. So why why are the maker fees then? Why are they gone? Yeah, I don't know, and I don't like it to be honest, because I think it's it's a big disincentive for really highly liquid markets. Because if yeah. you if you have no fees for makers then you can have basically zero spread mm -hmm. on the market because everybody wants to be at the front of the order book. Mm -hmm. And then that creates, because they can actually run um, an algorithm that doesn't have an edge over the market and they can still earn the rebate for the people trading. And you get this cycle and then it, it grows over time. Um, I don't so know probably, if it's probably more greed than anything. Yeah, I don't know if it's greed. It could, could just be down to greed, yeah. short-sightedness. Maybe people who are inexperienced in traditional finance, mm -hmm. just starting exchanges. Um, but I think that will change over the next you know, year or two. I think we'll see more people enter the space who understand how this stuff works in traditional finance. Mm -hmm. um, and there's definitely a huge gap in the market right now for a token exchange that offers good rebates to market makers, because that would be a very liquid market in, in a fairly short period of time. Okay. We'll see it. Uh, the second question is, can exchanges work with no maker or taker fees? The answer, they well, so, you, that yeah, so you can function obviously with no maker fees, you can't really function with no taker fees because then it's free to wash trade. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's why you have taker fees, so there's a disincentive to wash trading. Yeah. What we have in crypto right now is the ICO project pays those fees. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to keep their investors happy, yeah. who don't really understand what they're, what they're paying for through their investment in that project. and then. You know the the payment to the exchange. Okay. Uh, how is market make it? Sorry. How is market making different in crypto compared to traditional markets? Well, I think we've covered that. <laughs> we have. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, in the in the crudest sense, you could really say what we have in crypto are not market makers, and a lot of the things that they're doing are, are, are 
illegal mm-hmm. in normal markets. Yes, very much so. <laughs> uh, this is quite an interesting one. So a project that I've talked about in the past is Republic Protocol. Okay. I, don't, I don't know if you know about it. Yeah, I do. They, yes, they're running like a dark pool. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. in regular stock markets, that takes up a lot of the trading volume. Do you believe that dark pools will have a role in the future of cryptos? Mm-hmm. And, and on top of that, yeah. is, there, is there incentive to use dark pools over OTC if you have a big order? Well, I think the thing that I love, like, really, I mean, I'm very familiar, we used to have um, REN tokens, we don't, don't need more, but um, what, I, what I really like about REN is that it's actually truly decentralised. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I really like anything that, you know, remove, I mean, a lot of the problems we've talked about with exchanges come from the fact that they're centralised entities. So I like anything that's, you know, really proper decentralized tech. Mm -hmm. And that is the interview. I'd like to say a big thank you to Lewis for giving up his time and coming on the channel to explain these complex topics. He wasn't promoting his own project, he wasn't shilling anything, he was just very generous in explaining everything to me and hopefully to you as well. If you've enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. From Tom here at Crypto Gurus, thank you for watching. We will speak again very soon.